Our church, we're in between Legoland and the flower fields and the ocean and, of course, Costco. We can go there after church because they have samples now. It's great. Okay, I hope you guys got your song sheet. And did anyone notice what I brought for a sermon teaser out there? Yes, parachutes. Yes, right. So Rick's title is When the Parachute is About to Drop. You know that feeling? So it's about dealing with fear. So we are going to sing some encouraging songs this morning. So 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Because fear starts here. So we're going to be encouraged this morning. Okay. So you guys know the song? It's really good. still waters and he restores my soul he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil for you are with me letting go of every single one down at your feet every moment of my wandering never changes what you see I've tried to win this war I confess my hands are weary 
Father, we don't understand sometimes why life <clears throat> does what it does, and we don't understand the sorrow, and we don't understand even the answers that of our prayers that you don't answer. You're just sometimes quiet, but we know we live by faith, <clears throat> that you hear us when we speak, and you don't sometimes, you don't keep our hearts from breaking, but when they do, you weep with us. Even when we can't feel you, you are always here. And we don't have to be afraid, though our eyes maybe can't see you, but we see enough, Lord, to say that you are good and you are kind and we are safe in your arms and we are loved. Help us to trust without fear because perfect love casts out all fear, Father. Help us to walk by faith in your presence. Amen. All right, we'll turn to your neighbor and say, no fear. We have no fear. Okay, now that Lori has uh, brought the camera back so that we've given up on the view, go ahead and have a seat, if you will. Good job, BJ. <laughs> yeah. We're going to go ahead and get started, theoretically. Okay, I am going to uh, talk to our Father, so please join me in prayer here. Father, um, just the psalm that we quoted just a little bit ago, probably the favorite of all time for maybe everyone, but what great words. Um, you are our shepherd, we shall not want. We have all we need. Boy, we don't always think that, Father, but it is the truth. Um, you give us what we need, and uh, we thank you for your provision for us day after day. And I love the um, image, walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. That, that's just kind of not reality for a lot of us. A lot of the time, we do fear. Uh, but, Father, we thank you that we don't have to, and that when we return to the truth of that psalm and the truth of your scripture. And we see over and over in the scripture, it says, do not be afraid, do not fear. We have reason to be at peace. It's because you are with us. As the psalm says, I don't fear evil because you're here. Like the sheep who's calm with the, the shepherd, as long as he's present, that's our lives, Father. And we praise you as a shepherd who cares for us, who watches over us, provides for us, and every moment of our lives, we're safe because we live in your presence. And we thank you for that, Father. And we pray that you will make us people who live with great peace and great boldness and confidence as we go through life because you are with us. And you'll remind us of that today as we look at your word. So strengthen our hearts today as we consider what you had to say to us. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. So back in May... Uh, a woman called the uh, Krakow Animal Welfare Society, this is in Poland, the Polish city there, she told them there was a menacing animal in a tree near her home, uh, and it was disturbing everyone in the neighborhood. They asked if it was a bird. She said, well, she wasn't sure what it was. She ventured to guess that maybe it was an iguana. Uh, she just didn't know. Whatever it was, she said, the beast had been there for a couple of days and people were afraid to even open their windows in the neighborhood because of this 
beast in the tree. So the society sent some people out to the scene, and they were preparing for any possibility that maybe it was, you know, an abandoned uh, domesticated animal or even an animal from the wild that had wandered into the city. What they found in the tree, however, was quite a surprise. It turned out to be a croissant that was lodged in the tree. Uh, it's up high enough, but people weren't quite able to identify what it was. Uh, the experts theorized that someone had tossed it up into the tree in an effort to feed the birds, and it got stuck up there. So the message is watch out for those killer croissants. You know, you never can tell when one might show up in a neighborhood near you. Um, I, I think I might be a little bit concerned about that woman who thought a croissant looks like an iguana. You know, it's a little scary. Um, it's funny, though. You, you hear that story and you think, well, wow, people get freaked out by a lot of things, don't they? Um, sometimes we get frightened by things that it's just really unnecessary to be afraid of, and killer croissants certainly would be in that category, I think. Another story in that unnecessary category is the recent 911 call from a frantic woman in Washington County in Oregon reporting that there was an intruder in her house and could the police get there quickly and uh, the deputies responded immediately and very shortly, in minutes they were there and they came in, they repeatedly, the intruder was in a room and they could see light movement under there so they knew there was someone in there and so they warned the intruder, come out or uh, we're going to come in with our weapons drawn. And they gave several warnings and finally said, all right, we're coming in. Opened the door, ran in, and aimed their guns at a Roomba automatic vacuum going about its business. <laughs> uh, this is the truth. You can actually look that one up on the Internet. Um, you know, fear is something we all know too well, and unfortunately sometimes it's fear for good reasons, not for ridiculous ones like that. Today we're going to look at 1 Peter 3, verses 13 through 15. There's two concepts that are really important in this verse. One is blessedness and what that's all about, and the other one is fear, and these two things are connected, as you'll see. So here's what Peter writes in these brief verses. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats, do not be frightened, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. We'll stop right there and I'm going to pick up next week on the, uh, continuing that verse. So first thing I want you to see here or think about here is that we all, everybody wants to be blessed, right? Uh, to be blessed is to have something wonderful, something, some good thing that anyone would want. You know, that woman is blessed with a beautiful smile. That child is blessed with terrific parents. Oh, that guy is blessed with such a beautiful singing voice. Oh, you know, the Lord really blessed us last year, which usually means God gave us a bunch of money. But, you know, that's blessing, good thing. Uh, we're blessed to live in this country. And in, in this, these verses, I don't know if you saw it, but Peter identified a blessing that is a very curious blessing. He said, even if you suffer for what is right, you are blessed. How often do you hear people connect the word suffering with blessing? That's not a very common connection. And especially, he says, suffering for doing right. This is The context of this is that Peter has been talking about the kind of life that believers, followers of Jesus should live. And they, they calls them a whole, it calls it a holy life. And holy doesn't mean rigid and religious and kind of judgmental. It means beautiful, full of life and full of God's goodness. And so he's talked about what that life looks like in various contexts leading up to this passage. And he said, you know, if you're leading that kind of life, he says in verse 13, who's going to harm you for that? You know, nobody is going to harm you for that. They're, they're going to look at that and say, wow, that's, that's a great person, a great life. But in verse 14, you know, he reminds us this is a perverse, fallen world full of uh, fallen, broken people. And as a result of that, verse 14 tells us it is possible that you might be the kind of person that Peter's been talking about all the way since the middle of chapter 2 with this beautiful life and still suffer for that. You still might, people might cause you problems and mistreat you as a result of that. Um, 
And that, in fact, was happening to the people that Peter wrote to. They were trying their best to be the kind of people, the good, holy, beautiful people, but they were being persecuted for their efforts. Now, what's really strange is that Peter says, you know, if you, if you go through this, you're doing the right thing, you're trying to be the kind of person God wants you to be, and everybody would think is an admirable thing, and you are suffering for it, you're blessed. That's very confusing. That's not how we typically think of blessing. Now, what's interesting is that Peter got his idea about blessing from Jesus. You probably remember this. Uh, at the opening of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus said a number of things that were very surprising. Um, in chapter, Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, Matthew 5, 3, he said this, very familiar words for many. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he said in the next verse, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. He goes on in that vein, down in verses 10 and 11 in Matthew 5, he says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Yeah, that's my idea of blessing, people insulting you and falsely accusing you and persecuting you. You know, this is, these are some of those verses. One of the things when you study the life of Jesus, you see a number of things that he said that are just upside down. They're just, it's like completely different from what the world thinks. He says, if, if you want to live, you need to die to yourself. Uh, if you want to be great, you need to become small. You need to become the servant of all. Over and over, things like that. And here he says, wow, if you want to be blessed, Mourn, be poor in spirit, you know, be persecuted. Hmm. Uh, not what we think of as blessed. Uh, blessed means good things in life right now. Your life is really smooth and full of good circumstances. That's being blessed. So clearly, Peter and Jesus, Peter got it from Jesus, had a different idea of what blessing actually is, Right? Because it doesn't match up. Um, you need to note, if you think back to that passage there in Matthew 5, 3. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the for is a very important word. He's telling you, here's why you're blessed if you're poor in spirit. Because you've got the kingdom of heaven. Um, the kingdom of heaven is a blessing far greater and far more important than any other blessing you might have here on earth. So that's why he would say you're blessed. And what happens is in the things that Peter is saying, the things that Jesus said, there are two aspects why being poor in spirit, being persecuted, insulted, can, be, can mean a blessing. And that is that these things are part and parcel of being a believer in Jesus Christ. If you're being a believer in Jesus Christ, you're going to be poor in spirit and you're going to suffer some insult, some persecution in life. Now, um, that first one is easy to see. The poor in spirit, what does that mean? Well, it means you're humble and you're acknowledging that you on your own are not a spiritually wealthy being, that you have... Uh, a problem before God, that you're guilty before him, and you know that you're not as good, as righteous as you ought to be. And so believing in Jesus actually begins with being poor in spirit. No one will ever come to Jesus and believe in him for salvation, for rescue, for eternal life, for the kingdom of God, until they're poor in spirit and say, I have a need that I can't fix on my own. I need help. I need God's grace given to me, his kindness poured out to me that I don't deserve. If, we, if you aren't poor in spirit, you don't think you need to be rescued. You don't need help. You just do it yourself, right? So faith in Jesus Christ starts with being poor in spirit. It's that whole thing of I need grace. And the whole 
approach to God, the gospel of grace, is built on being poor in spirit. And so he says, you're blessed if you're poor in spirit because you, when you're poor in spirit, then you get the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And that's the best thing that you could ever have. Okay, I get that, but why this business about being persecuted, being insulted and all that? Why, what Peter says, you're, if you're suffering for doing what's right, you're, you're blessed. Well, um, the Apostle Paul wrote at one point that everyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, everyone who decides, who decides to try to follow Jesus Christ in this world, you know what happens to them? Will be persecuted. It's going to happen to you. If you believe in Jesus, there's going to be some persecution that's going to happen to you at some level. Um, here's, here's the thing. The New Testament tells us that the God of this age, the guy who is shaping um, cultures in our world, who creates the mood of this world, is actually Satan. He's created a system in this world that is opposed to God. So what is going to happen if you are in a system that is opposed to God and you believe in God and try to follow him? Well, you're going to come into conflict. And that's exactly what the New Testament tells us. That um, in much of the world today, as has been the case since the first century, to believe in Jesus... Is me, it means that you are going to be subjected to attacks of various kinds, ranging from anywhere from just being ostracized or criticized all the way to possibly killed. Thirteen Christians are killed for their faith every day in the world today. Twelve are imprisoned every day in this world. So that's what's going on in the world around us. Um, in our country, because of the legacy that we have in this country, we don't see that happening to Christians, at least not yet. Um, it's much more subtle, but it will be there. Maybe someone views you with disdain or ridicule or lack of respect. It's a pretty mild level of persecution, but it is, in fact, one of the things that Jesus talked about. People disregarding you, disrespecting you just because of your faith. On top of that, Satan is going to send trials and hardships your way because you are opposed to his plan and his system, and so he's going to try to beat you up. So what all of that means is choosing to follow Jesus Christ is going to subject you to opposition. And what Peter is telling us and what Jesus is telling us this is the very fact of that opposition, of those trials and of that persecution, whatever form it takes, in fact, is a, is a uh, sign that you are a follower of Jesus Christ and therefore you have the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus' listeners and Peter's readers knew what many don't believe and something I've already alluded to, and that is this, that having the kingdom of God is better than all of the blessings that this world, the best things that this world has to give us. Having the kingdom of God is better. You know, I read an article this week about Tom Brady, the quarterback, and uh, had a picture of him with his hands with seven Super Bowl rings on his fingers. You know, Tom Brady, you know, this guy, this dude is blessed. I mean, he is the greatest quarterback and probably the greatest football player who has ever played the game of all time. Uh, they call him the GOAT, greatest of all time. Um, he has, like I said, won seven Super Bowls. That's ridiculous. The next closest has four. Um, he's married to a supermodel. He ha he's handsome. He's charming. He has more money than he will ever be able to spend. He has beautiful children, a happy family. He's absurdly healthy. The man is 44 years old, and he's playing professional football. He's ridiculously healthy. This guy is blessed. Now, 
I know nothing, zero, about Tom Brady's spiritual state. I hope he knows God. I don't know whether he does or not. But for the sake of illustration, I want you to imagine that he doesn't know God and doesn't have the kingdom of God. So here's the question. Assuming that, who would you rather be? Tom Brady or um, a Christian in Iran who has been repeatedly beaten, has had everything taken away from him, and now has been put in prison and is sentenced to die. Which of those two people would you rather be? Uh, well, okay, so is there a is there a, option C? You know, I know. Here's the thing. The guy in prison knows God, knows God is with him, is forgiven, is loved by God and accepted by God, and knows that he is going to have eternal life. Our Tom Brady, if he doesn't know God, has a lot of stuff, but he has none of that. He will never be at peace, truly, because he's at war with God in his soul because that relationship with God has not been repaired and he doesn't know what's going to happen to him when he dies. Having the kingdom of God is way better. There, there is no amount of money on this earth that can buy that for anyone. You know, um, this is like comparing the two ultimately really is like comparing owning a mansion on a gorgeous private tropical island to having a, a shack made out of uh, discarded tin at the Tijuana dump. I know, I know all of us think, oh yeah, the guy in prison is in the Tijuana dump. No, he's got the private island. The guy who has everything in this world but doesn't have the kingdom of God is living in the dump. So that's why Peter and Jesus would say, I know you're suffering for righteousness, for the good that you do, and you're blessed because of it, because you have the kingdom of God. Now, there's a second aspect of why those who suffer for Christ, uh, suffer in Christ are blessed. And it is that suffering itself actually can help reset our thinking about what really matters in life and get us focused on what really does count. You know, years ago, Lori and I had the difficult job of counseling a couple whose beloved son had just died in a tragic accident. Um, they were absolutely devastated. They were as crushed by grief as anyone I have ever had to deal with, and I have to tell you, in years of ministry, I've had to deal with people dealing with a lot of grief. These were the most extreme. Um, mostly, we spent a lot of time with them just listening and crying with them and praying with them. But over time, they began to ask questions. They said, we need to help you. We need you to help us get some answers to some of the questions we have and to help us know how do we deal with this? How, how can we get some perspective on this? In the midst of that, um, we shared with them in those conversations some of the things that we had to go through that we learned through the, the death of our son. Um, in that horrifying, excruciating experience, there came a time when we saw with sharp clarity what really matters in life. And, and this was like, I, I was just talking to a friend a couple of weeks ago who'd had cataract surgery, and he said, it was amazing. He said, I, I had not noticed that my eyesight was getting dimmer. He said, man, got the cataract surgery, and I mean, in the next day, I could not believe how crisp everything was, how clear, how vivid the colors were. It was so bright and beautiful. This experience with going through the death of a child had an effect kind of like that on us because all of a sudden we could see life in a whole new way that where it was very crisp, very clear, and what we learned was by far 
having the kingdom of God is immensely more important than anything else in life. In fact, compared to it, nothing else matters. Um, it was, it's, this one truth was so bright and glaring, it, it blocked out everything else the way the brilliance of the sun blocks out the stars. It's like, oh my goodness, I see it. I see it. This is what matters. Um, and I realized, both Lori and I did, that all of the things that we struggle over, the things we tend to obsess about, the, the, the things we strive for, are completely trivial compared to having the kingdom of God. I didn't just know it in my head, which most Christians do, but I felt it in every cell of my body. I could feel the power of that lesson. And I remember thinking, I will never worry or stress about anything again because all of these things don't matter. That's what that suffering did for us. Now, sad part about that is we eventually experienced healing from that. You know, and it's, you don't ever get over the death of a child. The, the scar will always be there, but the, you don't feel the pain of it so much. Life starts to return to its normal patterns. You go on, and sadly, that vivid clarity of that, that lesson begins to fade a little bit. It's like the cataracts start growing over your spiritual eyes again, and you lose track, and you start getting stressed about stuff that you thought, I'm never going to worry about things like that again. I think that's part of why Jesus said we are blessed when we suffer hardships. C.S. Lewis said that God whispers to us in our pleasures and shouts to us in our pain. In the difficulty of life, we were reminded of what a precious gift we have and being reconciled to God and given the hope of eternal life in his kingdom. Uh, it is so important for us to understand that uh, that truth, that this is at the core of a blessed life, because uh, as long as we think that a real blessed life is one that has all of the best things of this life, all we do is doom ourselves to futility because we will be pursuing those blessings of this world. We'll put our hearts on those things only to be dis disappointed over and over again because the, what we're looking for, the peace and the joy and the hope, it's not there. It's in the kingdom of God. Those things, as wonderful as they are, and I, you know, I'm not knocking the nice things of this world. They're wonderful and here, we get to have a lot of them. But they can't give us peace, they can't give us joy, and they can't give us hope. And so we keep pursuing them, and we keep saying, why doesn't it get better? We doom ourselves to a life of futility when we pursue those things. And that's why it's so important to remind ourselves, oh yeah, it's about the kingdom of God, and that's what suffering actually does for us. Um... The other thing that it helps us with is that when we think the peace and the joy and all that that we, we uh, are looking for is found in the blessings of this world, we pursue those things, all that does is it creates stress for us because we want so hard, we're striving to get those things and, uh, and then when we get them, we're afraid they're going to lose them and so it's a threat to us. So all of this, this is good news. Here's the blessing of having the kingdom of God. So that's the blessed life. But there's an aspect of this blessed life that we need to see that's alluded to in this passage, and that is to be blessed, to be able to continue to live in the reality. That one of the things we're going to have to deal with is fear because fear is a problem for everybody. We all have it. Um, and Peter tells us that when, when uh, life or when other people threaten us, we shouldn't be frightened, and you see that over and over and again in the Scriptures. And the reason is because when you're afraid, you're not experiencing blessing. You don't, you're not having a blessed life at all. You're not having peace and you're not having joy. You're not experiencing love and hope. The fear just takes over your mind and your heart. 
I mentioned uh, already the, uh, the, the death of our son. I, I, you know, we will never, ever forget that night, June 21st, 1984, our infant son stopped breathing, and Lori started CPR on him immediately. I called 911. Paramedics came quickly, rushed him to the hospital. I went to the hospital, and I remember sitting in that hospital waiting room terrified. Um, because I was afraid that my son was dead and not coming back. And I remember just shaking. I could not stop. It was just sitting there shaking, and nothing could calm that. You know what? That's not a blessed life, being afraid, not blessing. So we're going to have to deal with fear. So Peter addresses that in this passage, uh, and he actually quotes an Old Testament passage. It's Isaiah 8, verses 11 through 14. 13. Here's what uh, Isaiah 8 says. This is what the Lord says to me with a strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the way of this people. Do not call a conspiracy everything this people calls a conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He's the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, so what was going on in Isaiah was that Israel was being threatened by uh, one of the world powers at the time. It was Assyria. They were afraid of an invasion, and the Assyrians weren't real nice. You know? So they were terrified of what was going to happen when Assyria invaded them. Um, and so the rumors are flying. Everywhere is talking about awful things that are going to happen. The future looks ominous. They're, they're scared. And you know what happens in that kind of a context? Man, the conspiracy theories start flying everywhere. You know, the Internet, the social media have made conspiracy theories a, a, a real curse on our culture because they, they spread like wildfire. But they're not new. Isaiah, 2,800 years ago, was having to deal with conspiracy theories. One of them was that Isaiah was actually conspiring against Israel and was in league with the Assyrians to help them. Um, you know, have you ever wondered why people seem so quick to believe in conspiracy theories? Um, man, fear breeds conspiracy theories. And the recent pandemic, heard any theories of conspiracies going... Uh, you know what? There are some classics. You probably have not heard this one. There's, I'm pretty sure you haven't heard this one. In China, the conspiracy theory is that COVID was actually planted in China by the U.S. military. Yep. Because in 2019, not long before the, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic began, there, was, there were U.S. military personnel that participated in the the 2019 Military World Games athletic events in Wuhan. <laughs> so it was the U.S. military that started the whole thing. Yeah, that's the conspiracy theory. Uh, you know, and you've heard them all here. Oh, yeah, COVID's not real at all. Oh, it's, it's a plot of the, the globalists that, you know, own the, the vaccines. It's Bill Gates putting microchips. I am disappointed and dismayed by the fact that so many Christians have bought into and are prom promulgating conspiracy theories. Would you listen to what Isaiah said? Do not get involved in all the stuff with conspiracy theories. Um, you know, pay attention to some of the things that, uh, the conspiracy theories that float around. Have you, have you heard the um, birds aren't real theory? There is a theory on the internet, conspiracy, that the birds that you see are not real. They are, in fact, mechanical clones created by the government. They're battery-driven clones that are there to spy on us. You see them sitting on the, uh, the power lines. You know why? They're recharging their batteries. <laughs> I'm serious. It's out there. It's on the internet, and people are buying it. It's like... Ah, you know, uh, by the way, birds are real, okay? 
you know, my wife, Lori, loved birds up until recently. She doesn't like them anymore because they are destroying all of the peaches on our tree. Mechanical birds don't do that, okay? They're eating our peaches. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, people believe in conspiracy theories primarily because they have this sense. Uh, they feel like there's, life is kind of against me. They, a lot of people have this sense. They feel powerless. They feel alienated, and they feel afraid. And they tend to think that there are forces out there that are plotting against me. And so when they hear a conspiracy theory, it's like, oh, that's right. I knew it all along. Now, the, unfortunately, there's another aspect of why some people believe in conspiracies, and it's because it can boost a person's sense of self-esteem. Because I'm on the inside, and I know the truth. And all these other people, they're sheep. They don't know. <laughs> Isaiah says, don't call conspiracy everything that, God, that these people call conspiracy. Don't, don't get caught up in that. Here's the thing. There are, in fact, secret forces conspiring and working against you. It's not people. It's Satan. And all of the stuff about people, most of, you know, you don't need to worry about that. There's somebody way more powerful than any group of human beings who's plotting against you, and that's where all of the stuff comes from that you should be afraid of or that we fear. And here's the great news. John, 1 John 4, 4 says, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. You don't, they're conspiring against you, and you don't need to worry about it even one little bit. So don't pay attention to the conspiracy theories. Don't be concerned about what Satan and his minions are up to. They can't touch you because you have the Spirit of Christ in you, and he's way stronger than any of them. So back to fear. Big problem for us. It's a drain on blessedness. It turns life gloomy and dark and ominous and unsafe. It causes people to compromise. Study the life of David. David was bold. He was strong. He was confident. He was a man who loved God, but on a couple of occasions, David became afraid. And every time he became afraid, he compromised. And he began relying on schemes and lies, and people got hurt as a result of it. Every time. Our fear can cause us to compromise. So don't give in to fear. Okay. All right. That's why we see over and over in the scripture, don't be afraid, do not fear. What's the big problem with that? Don't be afraid. Oh, okay, now I'm not afraid. <laughs> How am I supposed to do that? Um, here's the thing. This passage actually gives us the way we deal with fear, and it is to defeat fear, we must fear. Uh, wait, you've got to fear the right thing. That's what we're saying here. He says in verse 15, here's how to overcome fear in your hearts. Revere Christ as Lord. Uh, the emphasis in that statement actually in the Greek text is on the word Lord. Lord, revere him as Lord. Uh, you know, the same word that's translated revere there is, is the translated Matthew 6, 9. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The word hallowed, re revere, same Greek word. It means to set apart as holy, to regard as holy, have reverence for, have be in awe of, worship. That's what it's talking about. Revere Christ as Lord means to, to see him as holy, as unique, to be in awe of him, to see him as the Lord of all. Now, here's the thing about fear. Fear is an emotion. Um, one of the problems with emotions is they aren't ruled by reason and logic. You know, you, you can't talk yourself out of an emotion. You feel what you feel. You know, I remember many years ago when I was single and I got in touch with, there's an element of fear that I have. I have a, uh, a bit of acrophobia, fear of heights. Uh, I, you know, I'm not extreme, but, you know, heights just are not my favorite thing. And I found that out when I went with some friends to Knott's Berry Farm. 
And at Knott's Berry Farm, they had this ride. It was a parachute drop ride. And uh, I can see Lori Strong back there. She knows this. She's been on this ride and feels about it the way I do. You know, this parachute drop ride, they called it a sky jump. Um, you would stand in this cage that was, you know, had bars up uh, about this high, shoulder high, roughly. And it, this cage was suspended under a parachute. And they would take that parachute up 200 feet. That's a 20 story building. And then they would drop it with you in the cage. Now, as we were going up that ride, I suddenly went, uh oh, oh, oh. Well, nice view, but what am I doing here? You know, and you get up, and right as you get up to the top and it stops, you suddenly realize what this is going to feel like when they drop you. <gasps> oh, this is going to feel bad. And you know what? It felt worse. It's like, ah, you know, and you go down there and you get down to the bottom. The really bad thing about that ride was they did it twice. So they'd drop you and you get down and you wanted nothing more than let me out of this cage and they'd take you up again. And you get up there and it's like, ah, here we go. You know, I'm afraid of heights. And the weird thing is, you know, you, they take you up there, they do that, and you get down there and it's like, Okay, you try to talk yourself out of it. All right, there's nothing to be afraid of. They're actually not even really dropping the parachute. It's on a cable, you know. It's safe. There's nothing to be afraid of. And, and I survived it once, and you try to talk yourself out of being afraid. It's like, no, 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 there's nothing to be afraid of. <gasps> it didn't work because you can't talk yourself out of emotions like fear. So given that fear doesn't yield to reason, how do you deal with it? Peter says, you don't talk yourself out of it, you replace it. Instead of being afraid, have awe of God, which in the Old Testament was called the fear of the Lord. That's what fear of the Lord means. You know, when he talks about in the Isaiah passage, having dread of the Lord, didn't mean like, oh no, here comes God, I gotta hide, let me go. No, it means having such deep reverence for him, it's almost like the way you would dread something. It's just huge awe, reverence for God. Replace your fear with that. The important insight here is that worshiping Christ as Lord and being afraid are polar opposites. You can do one or the other, you can't do both at the same time. Now, what we tend to do is flip-flop back between them. I'm afraid. Oh, wait, I'm worshiping God. Oh, I'm good. I'm afraid again. You know, we tend to do that. But here's the thing. We need to realize that um, at every moment of our lives, we're doing one or the other. We're fearing Christ. We're having awe and worshiping him. Or we're being afraid. We're not doing them both at the same time. One will replace the other. And here's the thing. The greater our reverence for Christ, the less we will be controlled by fear. We will feel blessed. We will feel the experience of peace and joy to the degree that we have confidence and worship Jesus Christ as Lord. Now, there's a couple of aspects of revering Christ as Lord. First, we must worship him, revere him as Lord of all. In Ephesians 1.21, it says that God raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Jesus rules over everything, over all power. No, no matter what authorities there are, no what forces there are, Jesus rules over them. In verse 22, it says, God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. That's you, the church. That's me. It's us. It's all believers. And he says, God put everything under Christ's feet, meaning under his authority, under his rule, under his control, to benefit us for the church. How cool is that? Nothing is out of his control. Nothing is running around independent of him. There's nothing he looks at and worries about and goes, oh my 
goodness, what am I going to do about that thing? It's, uh, what I, it's a little too much for me. No, nope, got it all under control. You know, this is great news for us, isn't it? You know, our, our little granddaughter, Ella, five years old, is as gregarious as any human being as I have ever known. She, you know, she's at our house. Neighbors will walk by. She, hi, hi. He runs over to talk to adults, you know, kids, doesn't matter. She loves everybody, and she thinks everybody loves her. Recently, she met a new girl at her preschool and was talking to her, and, and she says, would you be my friend? And the girl says, I'll think about it. <laughs> it crushed Ella because she thinks everybody's going to be her friend because she's everybody's friend. And, you know, I thought, I, I hate that. You know, my grandchildren I love to death, they're going to go through life and they're going to find out that kids are cruel and they're going to get older and then they're going to find out that teenagers are cruel and they're going to get older and they're going to find out adults are cruel. People are going to hurt them. And I want to protect them. And it kills me that I can't. But God can. They will never for a moment be out of his care. My grandchildren are being watched over by the shepherd. And that is what alleviates my fear for them. So he's head over everything for the church, but secondly, we must not only reveal, revere Christ as Lord of all, but we have to revere him as Lord of, this is where it gets hard, our lives. Um, if I worship Christ as, as Lord, then he's going to have to be Lord of my life, meaning I'm going to have to both want and accept whatever he chooses for me. I will say what the Lord Jesus said in the night uh, that he was arrested in the Garden of uh, Gethsemane when he prayed. Not my will, but yours, O Lord. That, that's regarding him as Lord of my life. Not my will, but yours. You know, I don't know about you, but I have a tendency to rephrase the Lord's Prayer a little bit. I've got a better version of it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. My kingdom come, my will be done. Okay, how's that? That's what we want, we think. That's not revering Christ as Lord of my life. You know, I'm sure that you're aware that in an effort to get and encourage people to get vaccinated, our governor a few months back announced that they were going to have a lottery and uh, they were going to take the names of everyone who's been vaccinated and put them in a pool and they were going to pull out 10 names and those 10 people would each receive $1.5 million dollars. You know, I read that and I went, oh, it's the Lord's will. <laughs> you know, I, I thought, I'm not going to waste my money on going out and buying a lottery ticket, but here's a lottery that I've entered in just because I got vaccinated. This is great. And I said, Lord, you know, this would really help our financial picture. You know, $1.5 million, we'd be good, you know. So I decided that was, that was my will. My will be done, Lord. And I prayed, and I want to announce to you today, it wasn't God's will. Very frustrating to me. But you know what? If I'm living for his will, then I say, that's okay, Lord. I want what you want, not what I want. You know, my, uh, I, I have a new name. To Ella and Kara, our two little granddaughters, I'm Yapa. You all know that. Well, now Wesley, our, our grandson, almost two years old, now has a name for me. I'm Bapa. So recently, I was spending time with Wesley one-on-one. -on -one, and uh, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, he has a favorite TV show that he, he loves, Trash Truck. And he will watch that over and over and over. And it is a really cute show. Um, I kind of get caught up in it myself. It's pretty cute. But anyway, the problem is, I don't want him, and his parents don't want him to sit and watch hours and hours of television a day. So recently, when I was taking care of him, spending time with him, we watched a couple episodes of Trash Truck, and, and I said, okay, Wesley, uh, now we got to turn it off. Well, he didn't like that. He cried. He has a really distinctive little cry and really loud. But, you know, and I said, no, Wesley, we got 
got to do some other things. And I said, let's, let's go outside and go for a walk. OK, that made it better. But in going outside, it's hot outside, it's sunny. I said, going to have to wear your hat. He doesn't want to wear his hat. Made him wear his hat. Because here's the thing, Bapa knows better. And he has to say, Bapa's will be done, not Wesley's will be done. And he gets upset about it, but you know what? He's a little man of faith. He trusts Bapa, and so he goes and does Bapa's will. And that's where we need to be. That's what it means to revere Christ as Lord in our lives. Not my will, Lord, but yours be done. So how does that help us with fear? We can focus on trusting Christ to be Lord and say, I'm going to trust you with everything in my life, and that's what I'm going to focus on. There's some things I'm afraid might happen, and my will is that they not. But my real desire, Lord, is your will that's trusting, that's revering Christ as Lord, focusing on what he wants, not what we want. You know, as I was thinking about this, I, you remember the incident in the life of Jesus when he and the disciples were in the boat and they were crossing the Sea of Galilee and this violent storm came through and the boat was going down and the disciples were freaking out. And you remember what happened? Uh, you know, they woke up Jesus so he could be awake when they all died, you know. And, um, and you remember what happened? Jesus goes uh, to the storm, hey, knock it off, <laughs> flat calm. Have you ever thought about Wonder what would it have been like for those guys after that experience if they were in the boat with Jesus and another storm came up? What do you think they would have thought? Oh, a little rough today. Jesus is here. You know, a little turbulence, not a problem because Jesus is here. We're not worried about this at all, right? But Jesus is here with us. Now I want you to imagine that you're one of Jesus' disciples the day after Jesus has been executed. What are you thinking? The most confusing, disorienting, frightening, heartbreaking thing that has ever happened in your life. And you, you have no way of processing this because you've seen Jesus exhibit f f power over the forces of nature, and now you're thinking, how... How could this have happened? How could he, he who had that much power have died? How could he have let that happen? And you're confused and you're lost and you're terrified because you're thinking, if they did that to Jesus, what are they going to do to his followers? You're hiding, scared to death, confused, heartbroken. And you're forgetting the lesson of the boat. Oh, wait a minute. He's got all this under control. He knew all this was going to happen. It's part of his plan. He's got power over all of it. This only happened because he let it happen, because he has that power. No indication that even one of the disciples actually went through that thought process until Jesus showed up, risen from the dead. But they should have. And I suspect that after that experience, from that moment on, they never, ever forgot that. You know what? He's in control. He is the Lord of all. He just defeated death. I don't think I'm going to need to worry about anything ever again because he's with me. Turns out that worshiping Jesus as Lord of all and Lord of our lives is the key to enabling us to control fear in our life. The greater our reverence for Christ, the less we will be controlled by fear. The more we will be blessed and experience peace and joy. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you as Lord of all this morning. Well, and we thank you that um, you are in control of all of life. Nothing is outside of your wisdom and your power. And you are also in control even of the events of our lives. And you are always working for our good. And so, Lord, we pray this morning that you remind us of the lessons of First Peter. That the blessed life is 
available to us, but it's not the life that people typically think of in this world. It's the life that really is focused upon what's most important, and that is your kingdom and your glory. Help us, Lord, then to live focused upon your sovereignty and your power and your majesty and trusting in your will in our lives and pursuing it above all else. And let that replace the fear that so easily dogs us. Mm -hmm. We thank you as we do that, Father, that as David wrote, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil for you are with us. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, please stand if you are able to sing this last song by Phil Wickham called Safe. Worship the Lord daily and no fear, right? At least for the moment. Have a great week. Thanks for being here. <laughs>